welcome to week four of our Stop Trying and Start Training series. I'm Sarah Berger and I work at our Columbia Station campus and it's an honor to be here with you today. Several years ago, my husband and I took our kids and we partnered with an organization called A21. And the whole idea behind the organization is to help people who have been trafficked. And on this day, we were taking our kids to do a walk to raise awareness. And it was one of those days where it was like rainy and wet and it was the change of the season. So it was like fall. And we started this walk and we were about halfway in. And I had a terrible asthma attack. I couldn't breathe, but I tried to play it cool. And so like I just got out of the walk and kind of leaned over and Jake's like, babe, what's going on? And I was like, babe, I need an inhaler. But the inhaler was about three and a half miles away. And my husband literally took off. He started running to the car. And I was thinking it'd probably be about 45, 50 minutes before Jake's gonna get back with the inhaler. My husband ran this in like record speed. He probably got there in about 20 minutes or under. He was sprinting this whole time. And he brought the car, I got the inhaler, I ruined the walk for the kids, but what I remember saying to him when he got there, I was like, babe, how on earth did you get here so fast? And he looked at me and he's like, I don't know, I have just known in my heart that I was gonna need to run three miles to probably save somebody, so I've been training behind the scenes and I haven't told anyone about it. So for months he had been training to run three miles because something in his heart thought one day he might need to do it to save someone. It's insane what happens when you realize what happens when no one else is looking. Most of the most beautiful art in this world is hours and hours and hours of the unseen. It's the same with the famous athletes. It's not just the glory moments on the field. It's what happens when they train behind the scenes. I heard once that da Vinci wanted to get the human hand just right and he drew over a thousand hands for this one piece of art that he had commissioned. What we do in private determines what everybody else sees. And it's no different with our spiritual life. In our spiritual life, when we do what is done in private to grow us, to become more like Christ, to spend time with him and grow in these disciplines, we start to do this not for the world to see, but we do it for an audience of one. It's between you and God. And in the book that we are studying with Charles Swindoll, So You Wanna Be Like Christ, he talks about the idea of it's what's done in private. The spiritual discipline are not just the people you honor and you look at and you're like, wow, there's something special. He says, I promise you there were moments that they paid for that deep spirituality, that deep spiritual life. And I just want to encourage you that what is done in private, what's done between you and God is going to make the difference in your public life. It's going to make the difference in what others see. Today we're going to be talking about humility. I always laugh when I get assigned in these all church emphasis because I feel like I'm like the least qualified person to talk about it. So again, I'm coming to you as a student of humility. Humility is the idea where we don't think less of ourselves. I think a lot of Christians think you have to put yourself down or become small, and that's humility. But C.S. Lewis tells us that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. And I love that idea because really at the heartbeat of what Christ teaches us, it's that if you want to become great in the kingdom of God, then you are serving people. I love that idea, and in one of the most powerful ways he shares that is in John 13. It's these moments of the last hours of his life. And I don't know about you, but when I know that it's someone's last hours, especially Jesus, I want to lean in and I want to study harder what he's doing in these last moments. And he's with his best friends. And in John 13, Church, unfortunately, it's time for these. The old lady glasses. It says, John 13, starting at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
What's cool about that passage, he loved them to the end. That is an idea of not, he loved them until he died. The idea and the better understanding of this is he loved them with the utmost love. He loved them with everything he had. He loved, his love had no end. And we're seeing that in his last moments of his life, he's not, I don't know, doing all these other things. He's with the guys that are gonna make a lasting impact on the rest of the world. He's with his best friend. And he goes to them and they're at this supper and they're eating and they all have dirty feet. And during this time, it would be common to have a U-shaped table and all the men would be kind of leaning in on the table with their feet out behind them. In some um, studies that I've seen, they would actually be almost leaning into each other, which would be pretty weird today, but totally normal back then. And Jesus saw his guys and he, doesn't want to just talk about humility. He wants to show what humility truly is. And he gets up and he takes off his garment and he fills a basin with water and he goes and he washes all of his guy's feet. What stuck out to me in an incredible way when I was reading this story this time was I realized that he washed all of the disciples' feet. And what I mean by that is Judas was there. Judas was the one who sold Jesus out, who betrayed him, who threw the man who loved him, just threw their relationship out the window and betrayed him and turned him over to the chief priests. And I don't know about you, but I've been hurt by betrayal before. And the last thing I wanna do with those people is humble myself and let alone say something nice, but wash their feet. Jesus is showing us this incredible model of he wasn't just doing it for the people that loved him back, he was doing it for everybody. He was a God who did not come to be served, but to serve. In Luke, we get an interesting take of this story because the scene is set a little bit different where the disciples are talking and an argument breaks out during this dinner about who is the greatest. And I think to myself, I wonder if Jesus was sitting there watching in his last moments with his friends, in the last moments with the people that he loved, with the utmost love, and he saw this break, this disruption happen of pride, of what it looks like when we get it wrong, when we misunderstand who he is and what the true kingdom of God looks like. And he saw his guys talking and arguing instead of scolding them, instead of belittling them, he got up and he modeled for them what a true heart of humility looks like. Swindoll says that humility, oftentimes we think of it as like a character issue or a virtue within us. But he wants to challenge us to say, this is a discipline, that humility is an action. It's something that we can do. And when you think about it that way, you can start to measure it. You can start to say, okay, I want to grow in humility and I'm going to do something about it. In his book, he also says that there are three lessons in humility. The first one, he says, humility starts at the bottom. I love that you see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our great and mighty Savior, go to the lowest form, a form as a servant, and wash the disciples. I think oftentimes when we think about life, like we're constantly trying to, you know, get ahead or get the job title or get the stuff or whatever it might be so that we can look bigger or we can look better than we actually are. But true greatness is always formed when we start at the bottom. The second thing he says is humility grows out of gratitude. Every time I think about the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, I cannot help but to be overwhelmed at the idea that when I was at my lowest, when I was at my most broken, God found me. I was a young teenager and I was just lonely and confused and I just didn't know which way was up. And the God of the universe found me. He washed my feet that day. And he's washed every single one of our feet. He's metaphorically looked at us and said, you're mine. And then very much in reality, 
He loved us to the point of death, that he died on the cross for you and I. Every time I think about that, there's a gratitude inside of my heart that makes me want to be smaller. It makes me want to put God in the right place in life and say, whatever you want from me, I am yours. See, gratitude, when you have a grateful heart, it will always grow your humility. Three, he says, humility is an act of faith. I love this one because when we think about humility as an action, as I'm going to trust in God that he will provide for me everything I need, that I can take care of other people, that at the right time, my life, he will, he'll put me exactly where I need to be, exactly what needs to happen in my life. God is going to take care of that. So I can have the heart to say, I'm going to look for those in need. I can have the heart to say, I'm here to serve, not be served because it's an act of faith. It's saying, God, you are the God of the universe. You are the creator of all, and I wanna serve you. I wanna love you, and if loving you is by loving others, then that's what I'm gonna do. I also like, and we're gonna end it here, but there's three ways that you can really start to put humility into action. The first way is you sit on promoting yourself. I've been around people who are constantly looking for the title or constantly looking for the prestige. And I think the truth about humility is we all love to be around people who are humble and hate to be around people who are proud, but it's harder to look and see it in ourselves. And so I challenge you, if there is something you are trying to attain in life, go for it with all your heart, but go for it with the act of you are not promoting yourself. At the right time, God will do what only he can do. You see it all throughout scripture where maybe people have passed somebody over. But what God wants done in this world, he's going to do. And when you sit on promoting yourself and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve others. I'm going to show up faithfully. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to do all that it takes behind the scenes to become the person that God's making me to be you do something so much better for yourself and for the people around you. So sit on promoting yourself. The second one is stand up for others. Now, Charles Swindoll, he challenges me in this one because he says, don't just find the people that it's easy to stick up for. He said, find the people that are the hardest people to stick up for. Find the people that, these are my words, but are almost a little bit annoying and stick up for them. And it's like the ones that you almost think are the least deserving. It makes me think of Jesus washing Judas's feet. It was the last thing that Judas deserved, but Christ showed up and did it anyways. It's a humbleness that grows us. And the last one, it says, bow low before our God. I was watching a movie um, Pixar just put out called Elementals. If you haven't watched it, I'm about to ruin a very important scene, so you can end the video here if you want. But in the movie Elementals, the father figure, when he was a young boy, he had this moment where it was called the big bow. And he bowed low. He put his whole entire body and head to the floor and bowed low to his dad. And his dad did not bow back. And it was a way of saying, I do not respect you. I do not believe in what you're doing. And it forever formed this father's heart. This young man grew up and he became a father and there was something hurt and broken in him. Now his daughter had the opportunity to go in the world and do things. And she did a low, big bow for her dad. And this man, whose dad never bowed back, he got on his knees, he lowered himself, and it was this beautiful moment of this, I don't know, this just deep respect, of this deep honoring. It was the biggest way you could honor. And I think about Jesus Christ. And I think before I ever even knew, he bowed himself low. He took on the form of a human. He took on the form of all the pain, all the sin that we have ever done. And he bowed low and gave his life for us. And I want the rest of my life to be that big bow where I bow low in respect, in honor, in deep admiration of a mighty God who said, I came not to be served, 
but to serve. I hope you enjoyed the rest of your discussion and that this can be a time that you challenge each other and you love each other and you grow in humility. Have a great week.